Ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. So Susan and Thomas, are you there? We are here. I'm, we're here. Good. <laughs> as long as Thomas doesn't hide on us, I think we'll be good tonight. So <laughs> it's spring. I think it's spring here in Illinois. Is it spring in Colorado, Susan? Well, yeah, but spring in Colorado means we have snow one day and it's 80 <laughs> degrees the next day. So, so which we're, part we're, are you enjoying? Yes, it's uh, it's interesting. The snow melted, and it's and it's uh, going to be real hot tomorrow. Oh wow, wow! How about you, Thomas? You're in that California person area, so you're so funny. It's starting right away, Bob Padre. So it is beautiful here. We've had enough warm weather that I planted my kitchen garden, and so we have some some lettuce, some arugula, some herbs growing. So. And the tomatoes in the back, so things things are uh, starting to be nurtured by the sun and the soil. I love that. Here in Illinois, planted all my flowers. We've had frost two evenings last night, this two days before. So I have like fifty plants I have to cover up every time. So me and Mr. Garden and God and I have to have a talk. So I think he's going to let us warm up now and I don't have to cover up my plants. But I got him in early because we had 80 degrees a couple of weeks ago. So I thought, I'm starting. God told me, let's do it. So so anyway, but we're going to be talking about spring delight tonight. But before we do that, I'm going to ask my monk, Thomas, if he would open up with prayer tonight. I'd be honored to, Bobby. Holy Spirit. We are set free in your embrace. Hold each of us now. Let us feel you, hear you clearly. Jesus, brother, friend, teacher, show us the way of transformation. Expand our reality so we see where to focus. We want to be mindful of this path we have committed to. We hold ourselves accountable. And when we are swept away from you, we ask that you magnify your treasures and hold us through the wind of change. Thank you, God, for bringing us here now. I also have a prayer from Padre Pio. It's an opening prayer called Appropriate Today. He said, stay with me, Lord, for it is necessary to have you present so that I do not forget you. You know how easily I abandon you. Stay with me, Lord, because I am weak and I need your strength that I may not fall so often. Stay with me, Lord, for you are my light and without you, I am darkness. Stay with me, Lord, to show me your will Stay with me, Lord, so that I may hear your voice and follow you. Stay with me, Lord, for I desire to love you very much and to be in your company always. Stay with me, Lord, if you wish me to be faithful to you. Stay with me, Lord, for as poor as my soul is, I want to be a place of consolation for you, a nest of love. Amen. Amen. I love those Padre Peel prayers. It really draws near in our educational program. The students were studying Padre Peel this year, or start, starting yesterday, reading a book on him. And he's kind of up for us in a sense. So and anything with Padre Peel kind of touches my ear. So thank you, Thomas, for those beautiful prayers. This, the concept of spring delight, each of us is going to break down our portion in a sense. And I know Susan today is going to be, her talk is going to be on nurturing the garden. And I think she has a, an excellent slant on it. And Susan, you've been with us. How many years have you been ordained with us? In two days, it will be seven years. Oh my gosh, congratulations. That's awesome. Thank that you, awesome. thank you. And you've been a delight in our community and I'm so happy you get to present tonight to our community. So take it away, Susan. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Padre and Thomas and Barbara Rose. Thank you. I think nurturing the garden, the subtitle of this talk might maybe should be, it's not what you expect. Because what I was shown very quickly when I started to focus on nurturing the garden was that you don't start a garden by admiring the flowers. <laughs> you don't even start the garden with planting the flowers. Mm. You start by preparing the soil. And we we're just talking about the different weather and different places that we live, depending on where you live, you may be wanting to plant a garden and soil that's been frozen for a couple of months over the winter. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that when I lived in Connecticut, there were some rocks and stones that seemed to live for the most part several feet under, well underground. And over the winter, they would make their way up to the surface. So by spring, there would be all kinds of stones where I wanted to plant. Mm -hmm. And there could also be roots and things left from the previous year's growth. So there's a lot of stuff in the soil that's not receptive to new plants. Yeah, that soil is not ready to nurture what you want to grow. So the first step in nurturing the garden is getting the soil ready to nourish the plants. You have to dig in the dirt, loosen it up, clear it, clean it out. It's messy work. It's really messy. And it's necessary. So my guides showed me that the earth represents me. I want to grow. I want all the fruits and flowers of God's goodness to be in my life. I want this lovely flowering garden to live in my heart. And the first thing I needed to do was clean up the rocks and the dirt and the old debris, the gunk that was in my space. And for me, that gunk was old, lingering hurts, resentments, grudges, things I needed to forgive, that trace of resentment, the hurt feelings. So my guides were saying I needed to release these things. And my ego was saying, I can't let go of all that stuff. That person really did hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, she was rude to me. I'm sensitive. And then you can't just hurt me that way. That's not right. So my guides gave me a word of knowledge. Yeah, that's what they told me. This is nonsense. You can let that stuff go. Mm -hmm. You really want to let it go. You just need some courage. And the word courage really surprised me. And at the same time, I felt in my heart that I knew exactly what they were talking about. Courage is choosing to confront that which scares us. The root of the word courage is core, C-O-R, which is Latin for heart. Mm. See, the, the original meaning of courage is to speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. It means telling the truth to myself and to God and giving up the pretense that God doesn't already know the truth about me. So like all of us, every one of us, I've experienced some painful events in my life. And sometimes, like most of us, my reaction to those events has been to deny, to rationalize, to resist feeling whatever I felt. And denial, resistance, rationalizing, those are all words for, I don't like it and I'm not going to deal with it. But that does not help the heart to flourish. For a long time, I remember Sri Bhagavan in India. This was one of his main teachings. Everything fully experienced turns to joy. So my ticket to the joy I was seeking, to that beautiful garden blooming in my heart, was to su stop suppressing what I don't like so I can experience it fully with neutrality and let it go. 
and that was being told to muster courage, and dig in and clean that stuff up. So I wanted to learn more about this flavor of courage. And I went to what I regard as a wise source. These are four characters who each had something they thought they needed for their wholeness. And their belief that they lacked that thing kept them from living fully in the moment. As we all know, Dorothy wanted to go home. She represents that deep desire in all of us to be at home in ourselves, to be at home and complete with who we are. When we think we lack that, we keep believing we'll only be okay when we get to Kansas. Then there's the scarecrow. He wanted a brain. He believed himself to be stupid, but he was not stupid. Actually, as the foursome traveled on their way to Oz, he came up with some of the ideas that were very smart and very good for them. So he definitely was smart, but when we think we need to know things and to approach life through our intellect, we'll always think we need more brains. We'll always think we're not smart enough. So the scarecrow, scarecrow represents that aspect of us that thinks that the way to navigate life is through the intellect. The Tin Man thought he lacked a heart. He exhibited great compassion. He had the heart he thought he lacked. The aspect of ourselves that seeks to love fully will always think we need to be more loving. It's a really good pursuit, but it can lead us astray when we focus on our lack of love and conclude that we're not measuring up. And that's exactly what the Tin Man was exhibiting. Now the lion. The lion believed he lacked courage. Yet he was king of the jungle. He was massive. He embodied strength. At the same time, he was sensitive and he didn't want to intimidate anyone. So he held back his strength and he called that cowardice. I'll tell you honestly, that's a habit I know well. God built me with a strong will and strong convictions in what I believe. And I learned early in life that that could be off-putting and intimidating to some people. So I learned to tone it down. I toned down my strength and my presence and convinced myself that I was weak. And now my guides were saying to me, you are seeking wholeness. Honor your strength, embody your courage and move ahead into your forgiveness work, even where it scares you. And I found myself drawn to do something I hadn't done in a very, very long time. And honestly, something I never thought I would do in this life. I went to confession. Now, for those who are not familiar, confession is a term for the Catholic sacrament of reconciliation. You talk with the priest, and confess where we've gone off track. The priest listens, gives some counsel, often assigns an action for us to take for some correction. And in the name of Jesus, the priest absolves us, frees us from the negativity associated with the past errors that we've made. So it's a very, very freeing process. And this being 2021, my confession took place on Zoom which was actually wonderful. My previous experiences in life of confession, and I'm sure some of you remember this, they, it took place in a tiny, like a, a small, a very small closet, a dark, stuffy room. I talked through a screen to someone I couldn't see, who couldn't see me, and honestly, who often seemed kind of bored with the whole process. This time, I had about as close as we come to a face-to-face -face with someone these days. And this person, this priest saw me and I could see him. 
And he was really present with kindness and openness and wisdom. And in our conversation, he said, you need a forgiveness practice. I loved that. The idea of a practice meant it would be part of my regular routine. I didn't have to do it perfectly any one time because I'd come back again soon to do some more. It reminded me of Ron Roth, who used to say, forgiveness is not an event. You don't do it once and you're done. It's ongoing. So this just felt really right. And I was willing. But I also thought, well, what's a forgiveness practice look like? But you know how this works. Once you commit to something, the means to do it generally appear. So two practices have come to me that support me in this process of letting go. They're really helpful, so I wanna share them with you. By the way, you know, my guides can be a little sassy. So they said, if you're not yet walking on water, some of these practices might be good for you too, just saying. So the first is such a sweet practice. It's the daily exam, and this comes from Dominacio, St. Ignatius. It is a simple and a lovely practice. It's the last thing I do at night, and it just follows these simple steps. We we'll start by really relaxing into the presence of God. That kind of heals the day right there. Give thanks for the day that I've just had in all its totality, just gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity, for the experience, for all of it. Then I review the day. And I ask to look, not through my eyes, but look at my day through the eyes of God, which is very, things look very different than when I look through my own eyes. And it's very simple questions. Where did I follow God's will and where did I miss the mark? But I'm, I'm genu genuinely often surprised by what God has to, tell, to show me about, about where I'm following is her will and where I'm missing the mark. Sometimes things that I think, well, I'll give an example. I was working on something over the weekend and, a, and it wasn't finished. And several times, even though the work wasn't finished, I felt it's time to take a break. And I did. Now, the, the mind, my mind told me, ah, ah, you don't get a break if your work isn't finished. But that was one of the events at the end of the day that was pointed out to me as following God's will. God wanted me to get away, take a rest from what I was doing and come back to it fresh. Um, so that's really, to me, why it's a great gift to look through the eyes of God. There's a lot of surprises there. And similarly, when there's places that I haven't followed God's will, and I haven't acted in an aligned way. If you see that day after day, the patterns start to emerge so that you don't have to focus on it as, oh, I have to correct this thing. Somehow just observing it, being having the awareness of it in the, in the sitting in the presence, those corrections begin to come naturally in life. So step four then is giving the day to God. It's done, it's out of my hands. I don't need to hold it. And the final step is asking for grace. I ask for the blessing to do whatever learning or healing I need to do in the dream state and for the grace to live well tomorrow. Honestly, every time I do that, it leaves me wondering how, how I got by so many years without it. It's just such a lovely practice. The other practice is, is once I do, one I do weekly. I set aside about an hour and a half. It doesn't always take that long, but I certainly don't want to be rushed. To go more deeply into something that it's time for me to release. So I create a sacred space, make sure the phone isn't going to ring and that I won't be disturbed. I start with about 20 minutes of centering prayer to just be quiet and open up to the presence. And I ask for guidance on two areas. First, what is it that it's time for me to let go of today? 
don't usually have to wait long for an answer. I know my soul knows that I'm doing this work and that I'm going to be sitting for this session. And she generally has, has that thing kind of lined up for me. Sometimes I'm surprised because it can be something really that my mind would say is insignificant and very small. And then sometimes it is something really big, long-term relationship where there's a lot of hurt or resentment, something I know I had been avoiding looking at. It doesn't matter. Either way, whatever's up, whatever my soul says, this is the thing to release today. It's there and it's, and it's ready for me to work with. So once I see what that, that item is, then my next question is, what's the best way to approach this today? And I have about four different processes that I generally rely on. Sometimes the best approach is one of those specifically. Sometimes it's a combo of more than one or something else that will come to me. I just put myself in the process in the hands of God and I'll allow my guides to direct me and to help me. And we move through the releasing exercise. It can at times be uncomfortable and it can also be very sweet as I feel all the love that supports me in doing this work. Generally, it's like going on a very little short mini retreat. Dig in, do some work, feel that wonderful connection and feel so good and so much more whole afterwards. And as I've been exploring and learning more of forgiveness, I've also come across some books that have really ins are, are instructing me and inspiring me. Sent to Forgive by Helen Hansen. This is a true account by a woman who described herself as ordinary. And she was kind of an ordinary person, but she said did something absolutely extraordinary. Helen had recently experienced the sudden death of her husband to a heart attack. She was caring for her mother who was elderly and ill. She was already stretched pretty thin and stressed. And then her son was murdered. She did not know how to handle the grief that she was experiencing. Her other children, the whole family was generally close and supportive of one another but the other children were all in so much pain that no one in the family was there to comfort one another. They were just each lost in their own grief. Many, many of the people that Helen thought of as friends, they also just didn't know how to be with her in her sorrow and they drifted away. For the first time in her life, Helen felt very alone. She actually said she would have taken her, she would not, have taken her own life. It's just not something that she would do. So she prayed that God would take her. That's the pain she was in. But God had other plans for Helen. She was introduced to centering prayer, and that was perfect for her. Just sitting in the presence with no agenda felt very good. And Helen knew she needed even more. She needed to go further with that work. And it happened that Father Basil Pennington, who was one of the leaders in the Centering Prayer movement, was giving a retreat very close to Helen's home. Again, when you have that commitment, things just fall into place. So Helen went on the retreat, and it was at a Catholic retreat center, and Helen's background was Lutheran. So she, she had a little trepidation about would she fit in, would she know the right thing to do, um, but she knew she needed to go. So on the retreat, she was walking in the garden of the retreat center. She encountered a picture of Mary receiving the body of her murdered son. Helen was really moved. She stood in front of the picture sobbing. And as she did, she heard, I understand your pain. Now, as a Lutheran, Helen didn't have that, the kind of relationship with Mary that, that Catholics and certain other religions do. And certainly not a Mary who was going to talk to her from a picture. So Helen was pretty shaken off by this. And she asked Father Basil for some time to speak with him alone. 
She told him the story. He knew what had been going on with the loss of her son, how painfully alone she had been. And she told him what happened in the garden. And Father Basil said, it sounds like God wants you to forgive the man who killed your son. Can you imagine? Polite, mild-mannered Helen said, no, uh uh-uh, absolutely not. That is more than I can do. And besides, he's a horrible human being. He does not deserve forgiveness. And Father Basil said, Helen, the forgiveness is for you, for your healing. So Helen went home from the retreat. It took her some time to write the letter because she was not going to say, I forgive you, if she didn't mean it. So she had to bring herself to the place where she was actually willing to forgive the man who took her son. She came to that place and she wrote the letter and she sent it. And that began a process that unfolded over several years. She and the man corresponded. They met on a couple of occasions. She came to know him as a very, very hurt human being. Helen in time became a mother to him and he became a son to her. Helen described this as bringing her to a peace that she couldn't understand or describe, but it was a peace that stayed with her for the rest of her life. Now that's courage. Yeah, this is another book, also really excellent, very different, (laughs) very, very different kind of book. William Manninger, has written a handbook, a practical manual for practicing forgiveness. He describes forgiveness as a process that occurs in stages over time. It's not an act of will, it's an act of grace. We can make ourselves available, we can do our work to open it to it, and we also have to receive the goodness of God to to forgive. And he includes some really interesting work. It's based on the Enneagram, talking about different personality styles, different, we all have different ways of operating in life. And he has different processes that are helpful for different personalities. So I just think it's an amazing accomplishment to write a practical guide to a mystical subject. If you, if you want useful pointers on the path of forgiveness, this is, this is the book. This is our, our dear Ron Roth. And this, I think, is my favorite of Ron Roth's book. Maybe because when I first met him in 2001, this had just come out. And it was on the, on the table there where Padre Paul was having his bookstore. And I bought it and Ron signed it for me. So it's, it's very special. But the Holy Spirit for Healing, in the first chapter, Ron has shared a process that he he designed. He calls it the process for healing guilt with the Holy Spirit. Like most of Ron's work, it's simple and it's very powerful. And after I had worked with him a little, I, I asked him, you know, really, you call it process for healing guilt, but I think you can heal almost anything with this. And he said, yeah, <laughs> you can. So it's a, it's a very good proce- process for bringing in a lot of divine help to do some releasing. So there's, those are some resources that I found really helpful in the forgiveness process that I wanted to share. And I'd like to open things up now and hear from Padre and Thomas. Padre, many of us know you as a very loving and forgiving person. I think so. And you are that, and at the same time, as a human being, I'm sure you have encountered experiences that challenge your ability to forgive. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you'd share with us some of the things that have helped you to move past the difficulty and let something go. Well, I'll be delighted. I'm, I'm impressed very much, Susan, of what you presented. All these beautiful options of learning, and I think each of us, if we're really truthful, we need to forgive and we need to have multiple ways of how to forgive. 
based on betrayal. For me, it was a family member of mine who, quote, stabbed me in the back. And I remember always saying, I'm a loving person. I'm, I remember I was 51 years old and I said, I love everybody. I don't hate anybody. You know, when you announce it, then guess what? Like Jesus said about Job, well, you can test him. Well, you can test the Padre. It's like, oh my God. And it w- I've never felt that betrayal before. I mean, it was so foreign to me. And it's like, what do I do with this? <laughs> For me, I, I stood a little bit, maybe about, <laughs> six, seven months, and I refuse to forgive because I assumed I wanted to punish that person. And I love that quote is like for the father that said, forgiveness for you. And I was like, oh, I wish I'd had that knowledge back then, but it was really a true statement for me. And I remember just being defiant. And who was I kidding? I was just harming myself. Even though I'm this spiritual person, I'm, I'm a loving person, but that person betrayed me. And it wasn't until the Holy Spirit wore me down. And it's like, well, at least you got to be willing to forgive. And that's one of Ron's big ones. And it's like, well, I wasn't even, I didn't even not answer the question, present the question, because I, I knew mo- my answer was going to be. But eventually I got to that place. And Ron Roth always says, well, if you can't forgive, at least just tell God, just bless them just start there. And eventually I could verbalize the words, well, I forgive you, I bless you, you know, all those things. And he always says, well, you can bless another person with the money, be prosperous, you know you're forgiven. (laughs) And to me, and I got to that place and eventually it did, I did forgive. The one thing I want to talk, mention here is, and I think it's very important for me and anyone who's listening is we don't forgive. We present it to God. And it's Jesus who forgives. It's Jesus who gives us the grace to let go. And it's like, if we can ponder that in our hearts, it's the most important thing because we're all, and again, I'm not going to forgive because I can hold that against you or anyone else. And it's not, it's not true. Yes, we can be stubborn, but God is the one who gives us the grace to let go. God is the one who gives us the grace to finally be free of whatever that situation might be. And long story short, this person who was a family member, now I can talk to them. I can have fun. There's no difference anymore. But it took me a while to get there. And as you said, Susan, it's a process also. But thank you. I appreciate the opportunity of sharing my story. Thank you so much for sharing that, Padre. And I I do appreciate how you were willing to take the small steps mm-hmm. before the big release could happen. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, you know, the, the important reminder that we have to ask for help to forgive. It, it's, it's not real wired into the <laughs> No, I agree. Yeah. And I, I have sat with my forgiveness process and one process where I'm, looking at someone in my mind's eye and I say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I could still be sitting there saying that. And it wasn't happening, you know, and I was willing to keep saying it, but, but, and then I finally, I just said, Jesus, you have to do this. I can't, I'm, you know, help me. I, I, I need your forgiveness. You, you to come in and do it. And, and then it opens up. So yeah. Thanks for the reminder about letting in a lot of help. Thomas, I have a similar question for you. We all have difficult experiences in our life that feel sometimes like they just grab us and they hold on. And I'm wondering when something like that occurs for you, how do you free yourself and restore yourself? I love the piece about courage. So many of the saints have lived in a time of warring so many of them had to be courageous and strong. And I, and I feel like as I live my life, that the more experiences I have, the more I'm aware that like Job is God's asking me to stand up and be accountable. And that I have a bit of karma coming in here that I'm living through. I, I, I also appreciate the peace you have about awareness. I feel like the 
part of this is I go right to God. I go, I, I go to try to get as still as I possibly can. And I try to get curious about, about something beyond my reality. I've had an experience. I've had many experiences of needing to forgive and uh, others. One was when I was in, in prep school, I was small and I was mouthy and I was hazed. So as a freshman, the, my class, and we, I lived at school, my class one night t- got me, tied me up and put me in a barrel of, of water and who knows what else. But anyway, it was really hard for me to go back to that school after I graduated and I went to the college I wanted to. And I had a good experience in that high school environment, but I, I really held on to like not being good enough or something else that was lacking. And there's a, there's a piece in FSD where they talk about coming back to God when we fall down the slide, when we leave God. And part of it is looking beyond our realities, seeing where I'm feeling blocked, what my behavior has been. And this is when something is coming at me that I'm, that I'm reacting to. It's really about reaction and leaving God. I also look at where that whatever is happening to me from someone else has happened in my life that I've done possibly to someone else. So I surrender, I confess, and I give it back to God. And then I, I listen, I stop to listen to what the guidance is. Forgiving myself is a whole other matter. And there's definitely a larger confession coming in my life. So without going too far into my talk, (laughs) that, that feels like those steps that I take help me with my awareness and, and my ability to see who I truly am. And then, and then forgiveness comes up like being neutral to the event instead of me having to feel unresolved emotion so that in the best possible scenario and sometimes it takes a while to get there thank you thomas thank you thomas and thank you padre for sharing so openly your own experiences and your own processes i think if if we can one little thing that comes for all of us from tonight is kind of demystifying this whole idea of forgiveness and releasing things, getting things out of our space. It's worth it because it's just so human to fall into things that we fall into. And then it's our work to let it go. So thank you both, my brothers, very, very much. And I actually want to share, you kind of referred a little bit, Thomas, to what one thing that this is about. And this says to me that no matter what errors we make, the way back to our true selves is actually contained in in the word Alleluia. Because Alleluia means literally praise God. So you can pray it, you can sing it, you can chant it as a mantra. The word Alleluia will bring you back to center. Very, very powerful and lift you up. Wow, that was beautiful. Just beautiful. Thank you, Susan. You really brought us into that presence that we all love. We want to become like what a what a gift that is. And it's easy. There are some tools that you presented that we can actually enter into this place that God resides. God loves us. That's that's the bottom line for all of us. Wow. But thank you so much, Susan. What a gift you are. And thank you for sharing your journey with us also. At this time, I want to move into the healing time. We'll pray for each of you, offer opportunities for prayer. What I think I'll do is I'll start with Thomas first, and then Susan, and then I will wrap it up and pray for others. But this, this whole program tonight, Nurturing the Garden, starts here. And when we can let go, when we can forgive, 
great things happen. So Thomas, could you lead us in prayer this evening? Thank you, Padre. Father, Mother, we don't always have our health and our strength. We don't always have a close connection to spirit, our spirit, our divinity. But we can always rely. We always rely on God to be here for us in some way. We can always reach out. We are capable of looking again and finding that resource, God, that is in all of us. Holy Mother, Holy Father, this is our call to serve others, our community, our world, with the light that shines so bright through us, even though at times we neglect it. There is a constant fire that wants to come through us and is here with us now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. I believe you, Thomas, speaking of the Holy Spirit, that fire that wants to burn. And fire burns away things that we can't let go of. So what a beautiful prayer that we enter into tonight, individually and also corporately tonight. So Susan, can you follow through with us and pray also? Start from a place of gratitude. Gratitude for each loving heart that came to the call this evening. Mm. Feel the divine presence and also the, just the human presence of the, all the wonderful beings who share this time together, this community. And that includes you if you're new to the community. Um, it's a gift beyond measure. And I thank you very much, God, that this is in my life and that we have this for all of our lives. I'm guided to share a message that I received just, just before our recent retreat uh, that was about a week and a half ago, early, very early in the morning, on the Saturday morning before the retreat, I was waking up and I got the message, go prepare for the retreat. So I spent several hours in prayer and meditation. And as I was praying, these incredible gates opened up. And there was this field of such intense light. And I heard them into the light. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was so beautiful because it was reminding me, and I want to remind all of us, that the light is there always for us. And that we do need to do our stepping, our stepping in. And take that wonderful moment in that wonderful lifetime, to be in the light. It's our choice. And I'm just guided to want to send healing. Certainly there are people who want physical healings and lots of those issues, but I'm really wanting to send healing to hearts, to hearts that are hurting, the hearts that are broken, to hearts that feel not quite full, to hearts that don't know if they have the courage to do what they need to do. And to just send the light of God, the love of God, out to fill and light and warm all of our hearts. So that not only are we full, mm. but we're instruments of bringing the light further and further into the world. And for this, we are very grateful. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Susan. The theme that's really running through this whole program is about positioning ourselves and letting go, but the power of forgiveness, as Thomas says, that burning, we need help in this. And to me, that's where the Holy Spirit does her favorite work. Once we're willing and once we enter in and like Susan, you set us all up that we just enter into this place and we can let go, we can receive healing, we can receive forgiveness all of the above, because presence is here. And I am sure there are many here that are still suffering, whatever degree that is. Maybe it's a personal issue. Maybe it's someone else. And maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a health challenge. You know, even I had many texts today about family members that have people in Israel where they're doing the bombing. So we just pray for their safety. 
There's so many needs out there right now. Pray for the, the Biden-Harris administration and their team. Because our world is changing very rapidly and it can cause great fear. But again, the peace that passes all understanding, that's our, yours and my relationship with Yeshua, with God. So just allow that grace now just to overshadow us. Just come, Holy Spirit. Reinforce what heaven is like in our world. First in our hearts and then in the atmosphere. I just say thank you, God, for that direct need for people who are looking for healing, maybe some who are scheduled for surgery, some who just had surgery. We just pray for them now. We pray for the next person who will actually pass on and step beyond the veil for their soul to be magnified, to be prepared for a loving God's embrace. I thank you, God, for family members, children, grandchildren. Holy, holy, holy is, is you, O oh Lord, our God. Everyone who schedules for whether it's, I did say surgery, or maybe it's a blood transfusion, maybe it's you know, a doctor's appointment. We just want to cast out all fear and allow this amazing grace, this divine presence, just to fill you. Letting go of the fear, the trauma, and allow the angels now to do their thing, to minister to us, to support us bring healing, but also reconciliation of our past, present, and future. Just thank you, God, for every person who's listening to this call. You know them by name. And we just release the ministering angels now on their behalf. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And everyone says, Amen. Namaste. It is so. Amen. Nurturing that garden. Whew. Beautiful job. Beautiful job, Susan. And also, Thomas, thank you for being on tonight's call. And we'll be here next week. Please join us and share this with your friends. Thank you for joining us. And you have a glorious day.